Good, uh, <clears throat> good afternoon to everybody. Uh, to this uh, uh, early evening, we have a lecture by uh, Dr. Vasily Tsitov, uh, uh, who is uh, from USA, and uh, he works in the Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory, which is under the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration of the United States Department of Commerce, which is uh, briefly, it's a NOAA. It's uh, where, where it's, I mean, the world knows this organization as NOAA. Uh, Vasily is the one of the uh, well-known experts in the tsunami, tsunami modeling, tsunami uh, uh, data assimilation, and the many, many other things related to tsunami. For example, there is tsunami dealing with uh, uh, some real-time tsunami, etc. Another important issue is uh, uh, also Vasily is not only the, uh, the excellent scientist, but also he uh, promotes the international science of tsunami. He was the chair of the uh, International Tsunami Commission of IUGG. Also, he uh, involved, uh, he's involved in the activity of the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission and their program on tsunami and many other areas, definitely uh, uh, including the uh, national national agency where he works. Okay, Vasily, it's uh, uh, nice to see you with us. We are very happy that you <laughs> could make it because we know that what happened yesterday or even uh, on Sunday uh, night at your uh, place. And that's why we are really very happy that today you are with us and you will deliver this lecture. Thank you. All right, well, th thank you very much, Alec, for the very warm introduction. Um, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my apology for a little bit of reshuffling of the schedule. Um, due to the problem on my side, uh, we had some weather struck uh, our, our schedule, so we had to, I mean, I was out of electricity for, uh, for a couple of days, actually. <laughs> but everything is back on track now, so what I'm going to talk about is um, uh, the um, data simulation and the data inversion problem uh, in application to tsunamis. Why well, I called my talk data-driven tsunami forecast for tsunami warning. So I'm, uh, as, as Alex said, sort of uh, uh, a, 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 a general tsunami scientist because in tsunami, tsunami is such an interdisciplinary field that you have to branch out to many different uh, uh, different aspects of it: physics, mathematics, you know, geology, uh, astronomy. Even I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it. So um, uh, it's 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 fairly general. But the main goal for the for the tsunami science, if you will, if you think about it, is uh, well, when it started anyway, uh, it was to try to forecast tsunami. So when a tsunami hits, we can save lives pretty much. Saving lives is fairly, you know, pretty much the main goal of the science of tsunami, if you think about it. Although the science of tsunami, of course, is also for, you know, the, our intellectual advancement also. It's, it's a very complex phenomenon. So I'll talk a little bit about that. But again, the general uh, uh, sort of application goal of this science, if you will, is tsunami forecast and warning. So the better we do it, the sooner we do it, the more life we'll save. So the reason I say I'm saying is that this, you know, this data simulation and inversion problem that I'm going to be talking about is has, has a specifics in terms of the tsunami, tsunami, you know, problem application. And I'll talk a little bit about this, but again, the specific is that it's all driven by this goal of, of quick and accurate tsunami forecast. So there is, uh, uh, there is you know, fairly complex mathematics there, but it's also a very complex implementation phase of these things. And I'll talk a little bit about it. So uh, maybe just expanding a little bit of uh, wh where I'm from uh, 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 after the Alex introduction. So I work for NOAA, as Alex said, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. The reason for that is that tsunami warning system in the US is in NOAA. Uh, so NOAA has, is, is running two tsunami warning centers in the US. And one is sort of international tsunami warning center uh, that, that helps uh, countries around Pacific, uh, at least, to provide warning. 
and we provide, we, uh, I work on the research part of NOAA. So we provide research, we study tsunamis, we develop tools that we then transfer to tsunami warning. So I'm, I'm between the science and, 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 and tsunami warning practitioners. I still consider myself a scientist, uh, but, but I, uh, uh, we, we work very much and, and a lot with tsunami warning you know, practitioners to apply this science to the tsunami warning. So tell a little bit about that too, and how the science that, uh, that, that, that you develop or that we developed uh, can be applied to a very noble goal to save lives. So what I wanna start with is just a very general thing, uh, um, a description of tsunamis. Uh, because it's, it's still a fairly narrow field in geophysics. Um, the, uh, so, so I just want to do like to, to put us all on the same page. So we, we, we're talking about the same, you know, the same things and using the same terminology. We start, we'll start with just the, the word tsunami. It's actually a Japanese word and it's a very definite, uh, it's a very descriptive word. Uh, the J Japanese, in Japanese, uh, it, it consists of two characters, uh, and these two characters can loosely be translated uh, uh, to, uh, to, to English uh, as uh, wave, uh, it's harbor and wave. So is harbor, nani is wave. Uh, so that is actually a very descriptive term. And I'll <laughs> just, uh, I like to elaborate a little bit of that, uh, on that. It's not just the wave. Okay, it's the wave that becomes dangerous in the in the harbor only, uh, uh, where uh, uh, so where it becomes larger, big. You, you can't really notice tsunami in the in the ocean. So if you, I like to show waves are the reason there were other for waves that you know why why this. Oh, actually, this little illustration how tsunami. Uh, behaves and why it's not visible in the ocean. Well, actually, not why, but but how. This is a very small tsunami that that was generated in Greenland a long time ago. It's an old video, so it was a sort of small scale tsunami that generated by the uh, iceberg collapse. When then you see when it collapses, there is a wave propagating. It doesn't really seem you know too too dangerous while it's propagating through the deep water of the fjord. And this time it's 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 a very close propagation. But when it came close to the to the shore it grows and that becomes really a wave that's that's the harbor wave for you that's that's why it's called harbor wave uh, so you see that it, it's only dangerous when it's close to coastline in the harbor that's why it's harbor wave. so if you put it back into the set of geophysics say terms and the definition of tsunami would would go something like uh, uh, the tsunami is a set of ocean gravity waves because but but the ones that caused by the large, and large is the keyword here, abrupt disturbance of the ocean floor. It's a large scale dis disturbance. And in the previous example video, it was you know, relatively large, but, but the tsunamis that we talk about will be much, much larger in, in scale. Well, if you convert it to hydrodynamics, then the tsunami become uh, the gravity waves that since they're long, they involve the whole water column into motion. And that's described very well by, by the simplified Navier-Stokes equations that's called uh, shallow water wave equations. So what, what the, the reason I say that this, they actually, if you translate these Japanese characters on the right to mathematics, that's what you get, the shallow water wave description. It, it describes this term very well. It's, it's, it's the wave that's it's sort of uh, a very smooth in the ocean, not noticeable, but it's, it's become real wave in the harbor. Okay. Shallow water wave equations. We have a very uh, uh, well descriptor of tsunamis. Now, why do we study tsunami? What's the scale of this problem? Uh, just a little bit of the tsunami history. The, 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 the scientists in, in tsunami field, they're very careful collecting all the data for all tsunamis, you know, combing the historical books and, and, and the modern records also. So that's about, you know, 2,500, 2,500 um, tsunamis documented um, since about 2000 BC, so for about 4,000 years. Uh, so it's how you know it's 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 a lot, but but it's it's a long 
period of time too. So to give you a little bit better perspective on the scale of the problem, let's look at the last, uh, say, 15 years uh, or so. So since 2004, uh, you may have heard about a couple of tsunamis, you know, including the Indian Ocean tsunami, but actually there were well over 40. That's sort of outdated flight. It's uh, slight. Uh, it's probably, uh, uh, you know, up to 100 events that actually cause damage, not just detected, but cause damage and, uh, and, and uh, or, or potentially dangerous. Uh, and it, it killed tsunamis kill people at uh, this again for the last 15 years almost uh, a quarter million deaths were uh, attributed to tsunamis and the damage is also staggering 200 it's a quarter of uh, of trillion dollar damage uh, for just again the last 15 years so pretty large problem uh, that's why you know studying it and actually applying the models and and, and studying and getting the data into the models, which is the problem for the data simulation and data immersion is so important because we wanna use that to provide the forecast quickly. So to, to at least lower this number, but it was interesting, the, the last tsunami meeting, uh, uh, Eddie Bernard, which is uh, sort of the, the father of, in, in, in the modern father of this, of this field, he's a very well-known, uh, retired now scientist. He, uh, um, proclaim this this goal. I mean, not the goal, uh, the challenge. You know, zero casualties tsunamis. We, we we have enough tools, mathematics, computers, to do fairly good forecasts. Which I hopefully I'll, I'll, I mean, we still need to improve, but people still die. So we need to convert this knowledge into into results to uh, with the goal of zero casualties from tsunamis. I, th I thought that was a great challenge that he posed to the tsunami community. I pass this challenge to you as, uh, as uh, you know, the growing generation of scientists. Uh, now, tsunamis, uh, the, this, again, this phenomenon that's, that's generated by a source. And if you know the source very well, then you can simulate tsunami fairly well too. I'll talk a little bit about this. Uh, but if you don't know the source, you can't do anything. So uh, what are the sources, generation mechanism of tsunamis? There are multiple, the seismic, uh, the, so the earthquakes generate most of tsunamis. That's a count, you know, during this historical time of about, you know, since for, for, for us on yes, it's about 80% of all tsunamis are generated by, by, by earthquakes. And that's the most often uh, generation mechanism that you, that you hear about. However, there are other uh, mechanisms that can generate tsunamis. Um, uh, the landslides actually, uh, can be very large scale. And if they happen near the body of water, they can generate very large waves. In fact, the record for the highest run-up, which we call run-up is the highest point of the, of the tsunami wave inundating land. Uh, so the record of that belongs to a landslide. And I'll, I'll show you that at some well, landslide in Alaska created almost half a kilometer high uh, 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 inundation uh, run up. Then uh, there's meteorological tsunamis. Uh, there's, you know, there are typhoons and, and hurricanes. Uh, these are not tsunamis um, per se, but the, they can generate the actual tsunami waves, which is, you know, the definition that I showed you, large scale abrupt disturbance that can propagate for long distances as a long wave. And, uh, and that has become a very active area of research nowadays because they, they are not that, that large, but in some locations, they are very persistent. You know, they're very, very methodical while the earthquake generated tsunami is a fairly random process. We don't know what they happen next. Meteorological tsunamis, you know, for some coastline, it's, it's, it's a returning phenomenon like every, almost every year. Volcanic eruptions can cause tsunamis. And in fact, uh, they cause one of the most spectacular and, and, uh, and, and devastating tsunamis over the history, but they are fairly rare. Um, and then even asteroids can generate tsunamis. Uh, they are much more rare, but, but interestingly, it's, it's not a negligible uh, risk from that. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that also. In fact, I may dive into the sources 
of uh, sort of exotic tsunami sources for first before we go into the sort of the 80 percent of the problem uh, uh, the the landslide generated tsunami uh, that's uh, a Lituya bay and that's exactly the place where this the record tsunami was generated uh, it's a very long a narrow bay that's separated by by uh, a, 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 a little bank um, from the ocean, and the tsunami was generated by the, the huge landslides from one side of the bay on the right side from uh, from on this photo, and that splashed up to half a, over half a kilometer on the opposite side, but then it's this this white area around the bay. Uh, you know, the, the, it's it's actually it's the uh, forest that was stripped by the wave while it was propagating from the source to the ocean. So it was like half a kilometer near the source, but it was constantly over 30 meter high and and and, and many places over 100 meter high all along the bay. Amazingly enough, there were witnesses of this tsunami. Uh, that, uh, that that was it was after the earthquake, but there was the earthquake. There was an earthquake that triggered this landslide, uh, and 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 some people even survived. You know, there are a couple of people that were uh, missing in action uh, from there because the, the fishing boats often find rescue in this in this Lituya Bay from storms from bad weather, and and a couple of people actually saw this monster wave with their own eyes and survived it. Uh, so that's why how, that's why we know that and that's a little more photos it's uh obviously to a bay and, and the aftermath of the tsunami this uh, uh on, on on photo c you see you uh, uh, that that's this highest the, you know the record run up from tsunami that's where it, it is and then uh, you know some some other uh, uh, spectacular run-ups from this from this event uh we we do know how to model Landslides. I mean, they, they are very complex models, and that's just an example of one of them. And and we've uh, studied them for assessing the risk. In terms of the tsunami inversion problem, it's a very tough nut. It's uh, it, to crack. Uh, the the reason is that the tsunami, the 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 mechanism, uh, this uh, uh, little mass that slides into the ocean, has so much variability and so difficult. To anticipate what exactly the even the, the total volume may be, that uh, it's it's really and then how what what is the dynamic of this falling mass is going to be? That's the prediction of this wave is is a very challenging problem. Um, uh, so that's it, it's much more uh, a tough problem than than say the seismic wave that we 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 have some handle on, and I'll I'll, I'll show you a little bit. So while we can model these tsunamis, the Forecasting it and data assimilation portion of it is is, is a huge challenge uh, still, and but but it's a, it's a problem. You know we need to assess say for some studies like a hazard assessment for sensitive facilities like a nuclear power plants for example. You do need to know what's the largest tsunami can possibly be generated. So these are important. The meteor tsunami. I'll I'll actually come back to that a little later in the in the talk. Um, Again, they can uh, wreak havoc uh, in, in, some, in some specific locations, including U.S. or East Coast, which is normally not very susceptible to tsunamis, but, but there are some danger for the meteor tsunamis. And then in Mediterranean, it's, it's a well-known phenomenon, at least in, in some locations in Spain, it's almost a seasonal, uh, seasonal uh, occurrence. Volcano tsunami generation, again, it's, uh, again, it's, uh, it, it's, it's rare, uh, but but uh, uh, spectacular events, uh, and it's historically it it was attributed um, uh, uh, to the you know the, the end of some civilizations when they were attributed to tsunamis generated by landslide. The the most known is the Hera explosion in something about uh, three thousand years ago uh, uh, that led, as as many historians believe, to the end of Minoan civilization on Crete. Um, because the destruction was so large that the civilization did not survive this, this hit on the, on the very prosperous harbor there. Um, and that's the perspective view in sort of in the Aegean Sea, Aegean sea, Aegean sea uh, this, uh, and the blow up of the, what's, what's remained from this terra, uh, uh, caldera. Um, 
although they, they're still persisting today in, in uh, only in 2018, there was the last tsunami uh, that of the generated by, uh, by, by a volcano in Indonesia that claimed lives at the same location, which is Krakatau Volcano. It's a, it's a volca underwater volcano uh, in Sunda Straits between, uh, between Sumatra and Java Islands of Indonesia. In uh, uh, 1883, uh, 150 years ago, that uh, it, it generated huge uh, uh, tsunami. That uh, thousands, tens of thousands people died. Nobody knows for sure how many. Uh, in the close, in the closest location to, in, in the on the shores of the Sunda Strait. But the the same mechanism repeated itself in 2018, uh, which is the same sort of. The, it's called Anak Krakatau. It's it's son of Krakatau, uh, Caldera, which started to grow at the same location, exploded again, and again unexpectedly and again deadly. And uh, many people died there. So Indonesia is really now uh, trying to figure out what to do with this, with the prediction of that. And prediction always comes with data inversion first. The meteorite tsunami, that sounds like an exotic um, a mechanism that, uh, I mean, we definitely never see. Historically, there may be some uh, anecdotal evidence that there may have been, well, there's one anecdote uh, that uh, the, the tsunami from, well, and all the, the, the impact at uh, 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 around 60 million years ago in the uh, uh, Mexican Gulf uh, pretty much uh, eliminated dinosaurs from the earth. Um, the, but the, the modern problem with, with meteorite generated tsunamis is, is, is that. Is, 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 is that. Uh, the uh, NASA uh, trying to estimate the risk uh, from the tsunami, from uh, the, the, the meteorite impact in general. You know, there's this special group in NASA uh, near Earth uh, uh, bodies. Uh, and the, the, uh, and, and they, 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 they try to, to see what's, you know, what, what is the risk of the, of the large asteroid hitting Earth. And on the left upper, upper corner, you see this risk curve. In, in, in NASA, for some reason, they use an, an interesting metric for risk fatalities per year. I mean, it's an abstract uh, uh, metric, but you know, one can use that. Um, so the, I mean, since it's definitely doesn't happen every year, the meteor struck, uh, especially large meteorites, but they, if you stretch it over the years, you can come up with a metric and that's what they use. So in, interestingly, depending on the diameter of the impactor, which is the size of the meteorite that's, uh, that will potentially hit the earth, the fatalities per year, it's, you know, they, they're pretty large, you know, for the small impactors because they just happen very often. And then they become large for, for the ones that are very rare, but very destructive, like the end of civilization type events, which is more than a kilometer, you know, large body heating. But in between there is this uncertainty and different authors have different estimates of that. The reason for that is that there's uncertainty of what would be a tsunami that's generated by this, by this, uh, the potential meteorite strike. And that's where we came in, the tsunami scientists we were working with, 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 uh, with astrophysicists uh, to try to figure out, to, to narrow down this, this risk curve. Uh, and uh, well, when, if the, 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 the meteorite, is, meteorite is large enough, it will actually hit the earth, the, the, the ocean. And that's what you see on the right lower corner. But if it's a smaller one, like the one that we, you know, people actually saw one in uh, uh, what was that uh, 2013 over the city on, in, in Russia uh, it's a large city of Chelyabinsk in Siberia and, uh, and 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 people actually saw the meteorite exploding over the city create quite a bit of damage uh, up, like almost over a thousand people were uh, injured nobody died but what happened there was that the meteorite almost you know completely were destroyed in the in the sky. So what, what happens there is that the, the shock wave is formed, and that's the model of that is on the lower left, on, on the lower right. And then the question we were trying to answer is if this shock wave can produce a tsunami also, you know, not only the body itself. So in terms of the 
you know, big meteorite hitting the ocean, this Chicxulub loop impact again that I was talking about. The, uh, uh, we actually modeled, it's, it's a very recent study. We, we, we decided to see, I mean, this, the impact from that event was multiple and tsunami was probably the least, one of the least, dis, you know, disturbances from this impact. But apparently we, uh, it, it, it had a global reach at tsunami itself. You know, you see the model that, that we come up with uh, uh, scientists using very sophisticated generation mechanisms. It's not exactly the, the inversion problem that we're trying to solve, but in a way it is, but it's a very simplified one. We were trying to see with an uh, estimated uh, impact size, because we know the crater size, which we tried to put it into the models, series of you know, more, less and less sophisticated models, but more reaching. Uh, to see what the impact is, and and that's the the model of that. That's uh, it doesn't tell you much, but only quantitatively. It took about two days to engulf the whole world. By the way, you see the uh, that the, the continents, uh, the gray gray out areas. These are the continents. Uh, that's how they look like about 60 million years ago. So they're different. So that's one of the problems you need to come up with a with a proper bathymetry to see how the wave propagates. Uh, but 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 it looks like it was pretty impressive tsunami uh, everywhere for any cost on the uh, for this world. For in terms of these smaller meteorites, you know this is 250 meters, for example, meteorite, which if it's not a, an iron one, it will disintegrate completely uh, in the air. But then the big shock wave hits the ocean, and that's what you see in this animation, courtesy of our NASA friends and Galen Gisler uh, in particular. Uh, and that creates actually the, uh, a, a fairly large disturbance of the water that propagates with the shock wave also. And interestingly enough, the shock wave, which is the speed of sound, in some areas of the ocean can propagate almost as fast as tsunami. So that's, there is a resonant feature there uh, that we've explored and, and put some of our tsunami models into work and, and, and try to assess at least some potential you know, area for the risk assessments. But let's talk about the seismic uh, generation, because again, as I said, you know, about 80% of tsunamis is the seismically generated. And this little cartoon shows just, you know, in general, how this generated the, the, the earth crust under the ocean ruptured, and that creates the wave on top and this wave, sort of the bulge on the on top of the ocean propagates as the wave, uh, outward and that wave is the tsunami wave. So to model this wave that propagates across the ocean and we want to model them to, to, to forecast them for, for the coastline, uh, we, we want to know what the source is. Um, the, again, and, the, so, and that's a classic conversion problem, right? You know, uh, uh, so you, you want, you, you know some data the, the first data that comes uh, our way is the seismic data, because the seismic waves propagates about uh, thousand, uh, about hundred times, uh, uh, almost thousand times uh, faster than tsunamis. Actually, not. I'll take it back. About hundred times. So, seismic data will come first, and you you will have a lecture. You know. Um, or maybe you already had one uh, that speak in, in details about inverting the seismic, seismic data, seismic waves, uh, seismic recordings to understand the source of this shaking. And that's what we have to use to, uh, uh, to figure out what is the tsunami source there, potential tsunami source, or is it the potential tsunami source? There's a bit of a problem there. Um, the seismic waves, they, they measure the shaking of the earth, right? Uh, so they, so they, they do look into the finite period uh, of, uh, of this disturbance. What is generating tsunami wave is, if you will, the infinite period of this spectrum. It's, it's the static disturbance, you know, they, well, the, world, the, 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 uh, the earth shakes, the bottom of the ocean eventually displaced. And they, what you see here is see on the lower left, oh, sorry, on the lower right, is the 
typical, you know, just just a perspective view of this typical simplified model of this disturbance of the ocean floor. And this disturbance, you know, is of the scale of hundreds of kilometers. It's you know, hundred kilometer long, hundred kilometer uh, wide, very large part of the real estate of the ocean floor will be disturbed. And and uh, uh, the models that we have, you know, they're fairly simplified. They're sort of elastic media uh, de uh, uh, deformation models can provide you with the deformation pattern, general deformation pattern. Uh, that, that we use. And that can be inferred, in fact, interestingly, from this seismic wave, from the shaking that this, disturb that this uh, uh, disturbance creates, this rupture creates. And one of the ways to do that is called, you know, central uh, uh, CMT solution, uh, central moment tensor solution, which looks at many different, uh, you know, a, a recording of the, uh, of the seismic waves and come up with this simple, simple you know, uh, uh, point source solution, and to from from that CMT point source solution, um, we can derive this uh, what we call uh, 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 you know this the static deformation solution. That takes you know for the static deformation this simple model that we see again for the you know that's this Alaska uh, tsunami that was generated back in 1996. We're trying to model that. And that's the model source for this tsunami. Uh, to, to generate this disturbance, you know, to model this disturbance, and we call it uh, this. This model was, gen, you know, was was uh, um, created a long time ago by a Japanese scientist. Uh, uh, the, and, and we, we still use the same equations very often because they're very fast and and, and very convenient. Um, and, and this scientist Okada, uh, actually, it's an interesting story too. Uh, the Okada son uh, was actually did not derive these equations. It was it, he actually published a paper correcting uh, uh, the previous publication by Bensina Smiley, uh, which has a little you know error there. But he put it in such a nice you know present, presentable way that's easy to use. That everybody is using now these these formulations that we published, and so it's, it's this he become one of the most cited scientists in the at least in the tsunami field. <laughs> and and uh, actually, uh, I, I met him. He was uh, he, he retired recently. He didn't even know that he is so famous in tsunamis because it was it was his graduate study paper that made him famous. So anyway, the Okada formula is still used um, for to create in this seismic deformation. The problem with that, I mean, there's no problem with the formula, but the, the, the problem with the application of this formula is that it takes, you know, this uh, uh, seven, actually, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, seven, it's actually nine parameters, if you include the, the coordinates. Uh, and if you want to do it fast, and again, our main goal is to to do the the forecast for uh, for the coastlines that that are gonna be inundated soon, and it takes about you know an average about half an hour before the, the big waves will start hitting the closest coastline. That's that's almost a general rule, about you know fifteen minutes, but but the big waves will probably come in about half an hour. So we have this half an hour of golden time before uh, 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 before you can do some actions and say at least they evacuate people from the coastline. So you need to do things fast. And early on in the in the assessment of the of this earthquake, uh, out of these nine parameters, you may know only uh, one to three, well the coordinates, which is two and the strike deep and rate. Uh, let's see, see here. That's can be defined in sort of fairly soon. And fairly soon, I'm talking about, you know, minutes, maybe tens of minutes. And remember, if we have only 30 minutes to, to warm the, the first course line, that's a lot of time. But even, even with that, when the CMT solution available, you know, solid CMT solution is available, uh, uh, we still don't know this the length, the width, and the slip, because these are sort of connecting with, with they're not independent parameters, if you will, but they depend on each other and depend on the magnitude, but they're not known exactly. So here's the dilemma. I mean, we have to come up with those on the fly somehow. 
so to 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 come up with this very simple formula with simple simple uh, uh, definition of the source. So again, the seismic wave CMT solution is a sort of first line of defense, if you will. Uh, uh, and the version of that, it's, it's outside my lecture, but you will, I'm pretty sure, hear about that very well. And there are some faster techniques now and much more sophisticated techniques uh, that you can come up with, not just a point solution, but uh, uh, a solution that, uh, that, that actually creates you the distribution of sleep along the fault. And that is a much more usable solution for to to put into the uh, tsunami models for propagation and, and inundation estimates. But this takes even longer time. Again, it's it's it, it's uh, uh, the computers are getting faster and faster, and the methods are getting you know extremely sophisticated and fast. And that's the what you see here is the uh, the finite fault solution for the, uh, the the tsunami in Japan. I will refer to this to this tsunami quite often in, in the talk uh, because it was well, it was fairly recent. It was very large, and it creates a wealth of data for us to study, you know, to, to study the tsunami tsunami phenomenon further. Uh, so the, that uh, that for the, the finite fault solution, it was seismic, seismically very complex event anyway because it was large, and it was shaking for ten minutes. Uh, so. Uh, that solution was was uh, uh, available like a day, maybe a day late, which is definitely very late for the actual tsunami forecast. But it's still useful for study, for tsunami studies. So it's this is uh, you know the, the inversion problem is useful on on any time scale. But you know if, with my occupation, I'm very much interested in a very short scale uh, of of uh, uh, of the inversion problem. So there is much more, there, there, there are other data, seismic data, well, it's sort of earthquake data that we can tap into to try to, to infer the source of the tsunami. And that uh, the recently, well, like the last 10, 20 years, uh, the real time GP, uh, GNSS, well, uh, 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 GNSS data uh, uh, will become available. And that measures the permanent deformation right away, which is sort of closer to the tsunami generation phenomenon than the, the, you know, the seismic wave, because seismic wave is just shaking. To infer the permanent deformation from shaking is, is fairly difficult uh, proposition. You have to integrate that. And it's, it's, not, it's not easy, especially in real time. Uh, that measurements uh, the measurements, the, the, the GPS, GMS, you know, there, there are several other systems there that, uh, that, that provide real-time uh, 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 estimates of the deformation uh, is, is closer to is estimating the tsunami wave. The problem with those is that they are all on land. And uh, if you have a lot of them on land, like for the case of, uh, of the Japan tsunami, there's a lot of real-time GPS stations there. Uh, uh, GNSS station, well, it mostly GPS at that time. Uh, and you can infer uh, the source that's even far away in the, in the depth of the ocean. And you see it here is the uh, this in results of the inversion. I'm not going to talk about that very, very much here either. I'm pretty sure you'll have a lecture on that separately because it's a fairly complex phenomenon. Uh, com complex phenomenon. But what potentially it can give us, and it's still potentially, uh, it's not operational yet, is a very fast estimate of the CMT solution that I was talking about. Yeah, this, this point source, and if nothing else, it will at least give you the, the good estimate of magnitude, which is very important. In fact, even the magnitude, when I said, you know, the CMT solution does give you the magnitude, uh, but it, it comes later. What's, what, what, what seismic data gives you first and, and fairly fast is the magnitude and location. And even that can be a very critical data for tsunami modeling. But even that simple three, three parameters uh, will, will be very uncertain in the first minutes after the earthquake, especially the large earthquakes like, like Japan tsunami. Unfortunately, only large earthquakes generate tsunamis. So that's, here's the dilemma. You know, we need, the large earthquakes is the most difficult to assess, but that's the one that we need to assess. 
with the data with the with the data simulation. Um, but that's not the only problem yeah, <laughs> with the with the seismic data and the and the assessment data and and the uh, earthquake source uh, assessment data. Here's the plot uh, that I use very often is from my colleague from Russia, uh, Slava Gusikov. He's uh, an expert in the historical database of tsunamis. He's looking at historical data and then slicing and dicing it in many different ways. So here is he's trying to see how how good of a predictor is the tsunami magnitude uh, for the I mean not so much sorry for the earthquake magnitude I and mean, then MW is probably the the the, the most uh, uh, correct I and mean, the most uh, sophisticated earthquake magnitude so how good of a predictor of the tsunami force is that so he plots I mean there there are many ways to do that uh, so he, here he plotted uh, the earthquake magnitude, MW, on the horizontal axis. And on the vertical axis, uh, he plotted you know, tsunami magnitude. It's some measure of tsunami intensity, uh, uh, the, the integral measure of intensity. So what you see here, uh, if you say, take just one magnitude. You fix the magnitude 8, which is sort of the borderline magnitude. When you see the magnitude 8 earthquake somewhere in the, in the world oceans, you, you start to be concerned about tsunamis. Now, the magnitude 8 can generate what this, this tsunami intensity, MT, is, is a, a little bit of a strange number. It, it has even negative numbers, and negative numbers mean very small tsunami. It can be detected, but, but it's very small. So magnitude eight earthquake can generate intensity minus or tsunami magnitude minus two, which is pretty much non-visible tsunami, can be detected, but, but probably not comprehended, all the way to the, to the magnitude four tsunami, which is catastrophic tsunami. So you see the dilemma that if you use just the earthquake magnitude, which is the first available parameter uh, for, uh, for our inversion, uh, for predicting tsunami strength, tsunami power, tsunami energy, you have a very difficult task in your hand. You know, it can be all the, you know, it can be no tsunami or it can be catastrophic tsunami. So the problem is, of course, that, you know, the earthquake is, is one phenomenon and tsunami is related, but a different phenomenon. And, and with, even with all this sophistication, you know, the final fault solution uh, is, is, is a great stuff. If it comes in time, it, it may be it, it great to use, and it is great to use. The problem is that there's a physical limit there. The, 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 we, we still we need to get this all this seismic data uh, into our system and do the inversion, and that takes time. You know, the, the, the uh, seismic, uh, seismic wave propagate fast, but it's a limited uh, 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 speed. It's about you know, thousand to thousand kilometers per second. It still takes minutes and minutes for all the stations to register the earthquakes. And then and it does take all the stations in the world to do a good assessment for the, uh, uh, for the CMT solution and for the final fault solution in consequence. So it, it takes time. And, and then, well, it, it, it takes time. It's, it may still be inaccurate, especially in the first few minutes. And that was case in point in Japan tsunami. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, more about that. Um, Vasily, I'm uh, very sorry to, to, to uh, disturb you. Further. So, uh, Vasily, do you, do you hear you, me? Yes. Sorry, it is Alec, yeah. Uh, I, I have a, a question. Would you like now to have a break or in five minutes? Uh, well, well, what time? Uh, That's and, actually uh, a very good, very good point to take a break. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, yes. And actually, I have also a question, which is a scientific, related to this uh, Slava's graph. Uh, uh, he used the all earthquakes or earthquakes with the trust faults? Oh, the, 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 that's a I mean, it's a mechanism, now. because it's a, if it is an off earthquake, then it's definitely tsunami from magnitude. <laughs> Eight will generate a very small tsunami. That's uh, my question. It's a... Uh, here is all earthquakes or earthquakes with the mechanism of trust uh, faulting? These are all earthquakes. Uh, all earthquakes. And that's a, it's a good question because, yes, I, you know, there, there are sort of uh, two, uh, 
two, two answers to this, you know, first, yes, I want, I mean, this is to definitely to make the point that the earthquake uh, may not, the, just the magnitude may not be a good predictor of tsunami, uh, uh, tsunami intensity. But there is a, uh, there, there is a second point here also. Uh, the um, thrust falls definitely, if you, if you, se you know, separate this wall, it, it will narrow the uncertainty. There's no question about it. So you will, uh, uh, it will still be fairly uncertain uh, parameters, but it is also interestingly, uh, we, we started to find out that that, that even uh, uh, sort of what we what we used to know we, to think of a benign mechanism like a strike slip can generate fairly deadly tsunamis, and and that was the case in Indonesia in 2018, when a you know almost pure strike slip fault for different reasons uh, generated very deadly tsunami, you know, over 2000 people died uh, in, in a very special setting, of course. So while you're absolutely right, you can, you, you know, this, this plot is to make the point and, and it's a little uh, sort of, it, it, it's not exaggerated, but it's, uh, uh, but it's put, it's a lot, a lot of historical earthquakes, you know, strong earthquakes, you know, not all of them. It's not, not all 3000 earthquakes, but all strong earthquakes. But it also, uh, uh, you know, if you if you narrow it down, uh, you you cannot probably eliminate all the earthquakes, you know, just but but thrust falls because they they still pose actually uh, danger there. But yes, uh, yeah, the, uh, with, what what is my suggestion just uh, during this uh, break? Is uh, I think it's uh, your students or maybe it's Slava students could color them these dots into red, uh, you know, black and uh, green and or, 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 or blue and so on. Meaning that, uh, you know, the strike slip faults, it's uh, normal faults, but normal, I don't know the generator or not, but anyway, this is, uh, and it is interesting to see how clusters this earthquake and in which area. Um, might be this uh, trust will be on the top and others uh, down and so on, but it's uh, quite interesting actually, yeah. Yes. Okay, is. I am very sorry, yeah, but I wouldn't like to uh, keep you and others. And uh, let's now make a break until 18.55. Uh, it's okay. Uh, sorry, uh, 17.55. I mean, it's uh, something like uh, six minutes. It's fine.